Hello, and welcome to What the Future Holds for City Governments webinar. This is Mickey Shields with the Iowa League of Cities, and we hope you find this webinar helpful, along with other options and series. As a reminder, you can access archived webinars from previous webinar series on the League website at www.iowaleague.org. Before we get started, I want to thank all of the League's endorsed programs for their continued support of city governments and the League. I also want to thank our sponsors of, of this webinar, Solutions and Iowa Interactive. We appreciate their involvement with the League and for helping cities across the state find successful solutions. To begin, I would like to go over a couple things about the webinar. The League's webinars are free to access and view on our website at any time. Any handouts are available on the website as well. Finally, please send any questions to the League and we will be happy to answer them. We're happy to have Michelle O'Reilly from Iowa Interactive with us today to talk about the future of city governments. Iowa Interactive helps cities handle online payment systems, recreation and event registration, and develop applications. Michelle will talk about how innovations in technology are changing how work is performed, including a look at how these changes will impact city governments. Let's hear more on the topic from Michelle. Thanks for joining us to explore the future of city government. This webinar is brought to you by the Iowa League of Cities and Iowa Interactive. Iowa Interactive is the local subsidiary of NIC. Founded in 1992, NIC is celebrating 25 years as the nation's premier provider of innovative digital government solutions and secure payment processing. The family of NIC companies has developed a library of more than uh, 13,000 digital government services for more than 5,500 federal, state, and local government agencies. Among these solutions is the nation's premier um, digital assistant for government. It's called Gov2Go, and it delivers citizens personalized reminders and a single access point for government interactions. More information is available online at egov.com. So in 2007, only 10 years ago, this was my phone. I loved my Palm Trio. I thought it was amazing. I could talk on the phone and look at my email. And if the stars aligned just right, I could even get on the Internet. But later that year, it was actually replaced by something new. So fast forward 10 years later. In 2017, your home monitoring system can arm itself when you leave your house. Your thermostat can adjust to save energy. Uh, travel assistant apps can send you messages as soon as a plane hits the ground and it will let you know what gate you need to head to or which baggage carousel you need to go to to retrieve your luggage. It will even let you know which door you need to go to to visit your or to meet your rideshare driver. Your phone maps where you're headed when you get in the car and it calculates your commute time and it will automatically reroute you around traffic jams and road closures. Your chat box may actually wake you up with a weather report. Um, or it may let you know where you're headed um, later on that day. And all your data is synced to the cloud and available on any device anywhere. So imagine, if we've made this much progress in 10 years, where will we be in 10 more? So what can we expect in the future? AI, which is artificial intelligence, is already around. It can be defined as any non-human with the ability to learn. We'll see AI playing more of a role in the future, and we need to adapt to change and learn to welcome it. So AI streamlines our lives now. Think about your vehicle. If you're fortunate enough to have a relatively new one, if you swerve on the road, it may kindly beep at you. If you swerve again, it may flash a warning and suggest you stop and get a cup of coffee. If you continue to swerve, your vehicle may even autocorrect and take control of the wheel. These are huge advances and make our lives much easier and safer. One example of AI is context-aware conversations. You can say what you want. You can drill down as specifically as you'd like, and the solution responds. There's this cool app called Hound. I tell it I'm traveling to Charlotte, which I'm doing next month, and say that I need a hotel room for the night of Tuesday, November 17th, that I want to be within two blocks, of the convention center in a room for under $300 that has 24-hour room service since I'm arriving late, and I'd like a hotel with free Wi-Fi and a fitness center. And boom, it gives me three hotels to choose from. Makes Surrey look dumb, doesn't it? 
natural language processing is going to be big. Instead of typing, we're going to be talking to systems, and keyboards will become less important and probably obsolete. We're already seeing advances with Amazon Alexa and Google Home. These platforms stored on the cloud have the ability to constantly learn from our speech pattern and delivery. And they can adjust and adapt and become way more responsive. We actually have a team that's building natural language processing capabilities for a state agency customer service system. The possibilities are really endless with AI. AI will replace physical positions currently held by people, but it will create new positions and possibilities we have yet to envision. Augmented reality is the interaction of superimposed data, graphics, audio, and other sensory enhancements over a real-world environment that's displayed in real time. So think Pokemon Go. There are a number of AR devices from smartphones and tablets or heads-up displays for windshield screens and visors, or even head-mounted displays like glasses, goggles, visors, and helmets, even contact lenses and virtual retina displays. And there's actually many more currently in research and development. With AR, government forms and applications could be viewed and completed through a variety of um, devices. And this brings an entirely new meaning to the term accessibility. Perhaps you'll be able to effectively and accurately maintain street lights, cell towers, and fire hydrants. Firefighters and first responders could navigate through any environment equipped with these head and or shield displays, despite any environment or hazard conditions like smoke or fire. It could be used by city inspectors. Citizens could have visual and audio guidance um, of evacuation routes or emergency assistance during a natural disaster situation, and law enforcement could access location-specific information or geodata using smart glasses or in-vehicle displays for crime statistics. Public transportation and city vehicles could use AR windshields for traffic, accidents, scheduling, or even route changes. And facilities and parks could use it to provide a more powerful educational experience while encouraging and monitoring the appropriate use and preservation of natural resources. Virtual reality is an actual artificial environment that's created by software and presented to the user, and the user actually temporarily believes that this, nat this virtual environment is real. Virtual reality was actually developed for gaming, but has been utilized for the following. So cognitive behavioral therapy, Psychiatrists are using the technology to treat a range of phobias, such as fear of height, flying, and public speaking. Training for air traffic controllers. NASA has used VR for training and to enhance the mental health of astronauts that are in space for extended periods of time. And Arizona uses it to train officers to make quick decisions under pressure. Stanford University is experimenting with VR to um, actually in the courtroom. So jurors alongside um, judges and lawyers will be immersed in a virtual recreation of crime scenes. And then there's data analytics. We're already seeing this in varying degrees with Amazon and others. When you log into sites, you're browsing history, shopping history, location, demographics, and even your blood type. No, I'm kidding. All this data is collected, analyzed, and used to predict any number of things from efficiency and targeting. You'll see it when you see your news feed perhaps your entertainment schedule, items that may interest you, recommended shows on Netflix, pages you may like on Facebook, and bands you should listen to on Spotify. But how can big data uh, benefit local government in, into the future? So algorithms are created and built for prediction. So imagine if every city worked collaboratively to share data. That data set could be huge, and it could be analyzed, aggregated, and used to identify trends. So IBM has been working to pioneer municipal analytics for years. In our very own backyard in Dubuque, a population of 58,000, um, it was used to reduce electricity and water usage. In other places like Singapore, it's also been used to predict traffic jams 30 minutes ahead of time or to forecast weather patterns for agriculture in Borneo. It can be used to detect potential threats, reduce crime, 
and further protect the environment, project spending, um, and for money allocation. And then we have conversational interfaces. We touched on this a little earlier. So a chatbot is a computer program that enables interaction and conversation through spoken word or text. Chatbots can be created using data sets to field a wide variety of customer calls and general interactions. So back in January, a professor at Georgia Tech had a problem. 300 students posting over 10,000 questions per semester. He had eight teacher's assistants, and that comes to roughly 1,250 questions per TA per semester. You can see the problem. So according to the professor, the TAs were getting bogged down answering routine questions. Fortunately, the professor um, teaches a master's course in AI. So he designed a chatbot using IBM's Watson Cloud Services. It was expected to answer about 40% of routine questions, leaving his human TAs to answer the complex ones. So this is another area that's, that we've actually been working in in several states where our teams are building QA logic for dozens of frequently asked questions to be used by um, customer service protocols. It's actually very efficient and effective and level one customer service. So Alexa skills are actually being used within the Utah State Government to test technology, and it's been interesting and a positive experience. Um, NICs work to build the following skills, so fishing reports for every state managed reservoir and waterway, practice tests to get a Utah driver's license, and fun facts about the state, such as the year it was founded, who the go governor is, and the current population. So there's actually um, no need for a screen when technology like this can be read back to you. Um, when you're brushing your teeth in the morning, you're making lunch for your kids, or heading out to the garage to start putting together your fishing gear for a fun day of, of on the water, all of these things are streamlined and we're seeing it coming. So crowdsourcing is everywhere. In this increasingly connected world, we share real-time information ideas within seconds across multiple channels with a push of a button. So there's five types of crowdsourcing. There's crowd wisdom, crowd creation, crowd voting, crowd funding, and crowd outsourcing. In this uh, visual, it just gives you an idea of all the possibilities out there. So from reCAPTCHA, which allows Internet users to actually digitize archived copies of the New York Times to Wikipedia, um, to Wikipedia's more than 32 million pages that are written and updated by interested citizens, to apps that crowdsource real-time traffic information and restaurant recommendations from members of the public. We've seen it firsthand um, that you can unlock huge amounts of wisdom from crowds that lead to better solutions across the board. So what happens to this connection? How can it be used to benefit city government? Crowdsourcing actually allows the government to reach beyond the usual suspects, to expand and diversify the talent pool tackling a problem. We've seen it at the federal government level, but it can also be applied to city government. The possibilities are limitless. So what's next for using government technology to serve your citizens? According to the most recent U.S. Census data, there are more than 90,000 government entities in the United States, including city, county, and municipal governments, plus states and federal governments as well. And all of these agencies are housed within each of their own distinct government offices. So the structure of government and how it serves citizens hasn't changed much in the last 100 years. The job of government is to provide services, and it's the individual citizen's responsibility to figure out what services they need and which level of government provides those services and which agency in that level of government provides each service. Get it? It's complicated. So it forces citizens to become experts on how government is structured. And for citizens, it's stressful and causes anxiety because of the fear of missing a deadline, making a late payment, paying a penalty, and then having that general lingering feeling that you've forgotten to do something that's very important. Your constituents don't know how government operates, and most of them don't care. They're busy with their connected lives and expect transparency. So the goal ultimately is to provide citizen-centric services, to focus on a solution versus a website. 
So what's in the future? There's this great quote by um, Dave Fletcher, uh, Utah's CTO, and it simply says that innovation doesn't have to stem from completely new technology. 85% of citizens said they expect the same or higher quality from government digital services as they do a commercial organization. So these are just key elements to keep in mind. Technology is going to change and adapt very rapidly, but we also need to remain neutral and flexible. We need to prepare for a keyboard-free world that uses natural language, chat box, conversational interfaces, and an increasingly mobile environment to access things. So the emphasis on services actually doesn't matter from a user, uh, user standpoint. Um, websites are going to probably become a thing of the past. People want user-friendly, insight-driven device and designs. The idea is to streamline everything and make government a lot more easier for citizens by developing and delivering a multi-government, multi-agency platform. The possibilities are endless. These are just a couple of lists of uh, a list, sorry, of the resources that I used for today's presentation. And I thank you for the opportunity to present today. Thank you very much, Michelle, for the excellent information and guidance for cities on this interesting topic. On behalf of the League, I would like to thank all the viewers of the webinar, and I encourage you to contact us, contact us with any questions you might have in the future. Thank you.